So thank you, thank you everybody for joining. Welcome. Um, we're going to dive in, but before we start having a good time, there are a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to cover. Uh, firstly is the format. So for about seven minutes, I'll do a brief introduction of Net Capital. I'll introduce uh, the panelists, basically say who they are and the companies they represent, and I will share why I think this webinar is important. Over the next 50 minutes, we will have five founder presentations, 10 minutes each, and we'll allow four minutes, four to five minutes for them to present, and then five to six minutes for Q&A. Uh, after that, we will do a brief three-minute closing, and we'll let everybody uh, get off to, you know, to whatever they want to do this evening, especially from the East Coast, probably call it a night. Uh, the second housekeeping item is the timeline. Uh, so we expect this to be one hour, as, as kind of uh, mentioned earlier. I appreciate all of your time, so we're going to try to stick to the script here. And it's for this reason that we might not be able to answer every question. But nonetheless, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom to ask questions for these founders. And that's what this is all about. So I am Eric Cox. I'm one of the members of the Net Capital team. I also have my good friend and colleague, Rob Burnett. I'm also another member from the Net Capital team. Go ahead and say, hey, Rob. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, Net Capital is a registered funding portal headquartered in Boston. Our goal is to make it easy for anybody to invest in private companies, including the five companies that are currently presenting. We also have with us Ecotext, which is a digital textbook subscription service for students. Go ahead and say, hey, Joel and Nelson. Hey, how are we doing, everyone? How you doing, everybody? Uh, we have Watch Party, which is a content discovery app uh, to make it easy to find content with your friends. Go ahead and say, hey, Che. Hi, everybody. Good evening. We have Dome Audio, which has created an innovative new headphone. Go ahead and say, hey, Ben and Tim. Howdy. How's everybody doing? Charles and Company will be the next presentation and was presented by Lawrence Charles. Hi, everybody. And we have Deuce Drone, presented by KJ Hadrick and Timmy Hussain. Hi, hey, everyone. everyone. So we are super excited that everybody could join. Thank you for your time. We have members here from LA to the UK, and we have a star-studded group of entrepreneurs. We have a Super Bowl champion, a pair of MIT grads. But I really wanted to point out that you don't have to graduate from MIT or win a championship with the New England Patriots to matter. Uh, this is a time but we need to remember that everybody matters. This is a time that it's important to remember that we are all in this together. And if we all work together, we can really make special things happen. Um, I'd like to share one anecdote before we dive in. Uh, and this will only take a couple minutes. Uh, my dad once told me, you know, it, it, things should be good and they should be fast. And if you can't do both, make it fast. So this will be pretty quick. I thought about sharing an anecdote about the difficulty of studying criminal law, learning about due process when Eric Gardner or Freddie Gray were killed. I thought about talking about how when I run in the mornings, my wife gives me the kind of same look that is the, the anxious concern that wonders, is going outside as a black man uh, too dangerous to justify, unjustifiably dangerous. Um, but I think I'm actually going to share an anecdote that, I, that is personal to me that is a, a much more positive message. Uh, and that is that when I was in law school, I lived um, in an apartment, kind of a dorm apartment with six roommates. Uh, the model was, was based off of uh, Charles Munger's dream that no more than two people can come from the same school. Uh, so we had dentists, we had engineers, we had I was a law student, we had business students, all in the same room, cohabitating, commingling, and learning from each other. My favorite story was then one of our roommates, who is currently an engineer at Apple, uh, watched a young man come into our apartment that he did not know or recognize at all. He was a black man. He walked in, went to the refrigerator, got something, and left. Uh, I didn't know about this story until I got home after class, and he mentioned it to me. And I said, so what did you do? And he said to me, I just assumed he was a lawyer. I love that story because I think about how just existing in this world and doing what we're doing has a kind of unconscious effect on people. Just by showing black excellence every day and doing what we're doing, it can have an effect on people and it can help people look at people differently. And so if more people see this and assume when they see a black person that they're an entrepreneur, that they're an investor, that they matter, I think that could be a very, very positive thing to happen. 
So nobody came here to listen to me speak except for my family. Hey, mom and dad, Gerald. Uh, so I'm going to wrap that up and we're going to go right into the last reason why I think this is important. And that is that venture capital has historically excluded minorities and net capital is here to change that. Uh, quick disclosures. This is not legal, financial or investment advice. There is plenty of risk associated with investing in early stage companies. And so I want everybody to remember that you should not invest uh, any more than you're comfortable losing. That being said, we hope that you find success and create wealth through the Net Capital platform. That is all I'm going to say about that. At 5.08, we're going to turn to the pitches. So first up, we have Ecotext presented by Nelson Thomas and Joel Gunku. Ecotext is a digital textbook subscription service for college students. Go ahead, Joel. Awesome. Thank you for that intro, Eric. Um, just a thumbs up. Everyone can see my screen okay? Perfect, perfect. You know, today I want to talk to you guys about Ecotex and how we're creating opportunity through affordability. I'm sure so many of us in the, in the webinar today can relate to paying for expensive textbooks throughout our college career. So Ecotex, we're looking to really address the economical pain point, but deliver a product that is modern for the modern student today. Um, we have a rock star team, really diverse through our academic disciplines, um, our background, and, and also what we provide to the team, half business and half technical. My name is Joel Kunku, CEO of Ecotex, and alongside me today presenting, I have our, my rock star chief marketing officer, Mr. Nelson Thomas. Yeah. Thank you, Joel, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join here to hear from some amazing companies. And I also want to thank Eric and Rob for having this event and placing the importance on, on featuring uh, you know, uh, uh, minority founders and a beautiful anecdote there to be, begin, Rob, uh, Eric, excuse me. So uh, thank you very much for that. And to Joel's point, you know, we're proud of the fact that we have a diverse team, not only in, ethnic, in ethnicity, but also in, uh, in perspective and skill set that really uh, gives us the opportunity to, to build a robust platform that includes all those uh, unique perspectives. So really to get into it, uh, John Fallon, the CEO of Pearson's, indicated that said here that the $300 textbook is dead, right? And to put that in perspective, Pearson owns a $6.6 .6 billion market share in the textbook industry, um, which you know, really indicates that um, truly this, this is a market that's ready for disruption, that is shifting rapidly. And here at Egotex, we are in a position to really uh, you know, take advantage of that market shift as we had the wherewithal three years in advance um, to, be in a, to build up a company that is, is ready for this moment here as we see it shifting. And, through our market research as well, we've found that 30% of students simply are not buying textbooks. And, and that also, um, you know, by the year 2024, 2025, market insiders have indicated that they believe the textbook industry is going to go in a completely digital fashion and only do printed textbooks by request. So again, we're here, we had this idea for a better textbook solution early on, and we are here to take advantage of this uh, rapidly changing marketplace. And really to put the, the entire industry in perspective as well, it's a $14 billion industry. It's an absolutely massive, massive industry that has about 20 million undergraduate students, 5,000 colleges and universities, and $160 million textbooks issued every year. And that number is only going up as you see more and more of a premium and demand being placed um, on uh, you know, students and, and young patrons to obtain a higher tertiary degree. So you know, here at Ecotex, again, we have seen this, this trend coming. Um, we have been prepared for and we are ready for this, this market shift that is really being accelerated um, through the COVID-19 pandemic. Awesome. And here at Ecotex, we deliver digital textbooks to college students via semester subscription. So we're providing a platform that allows developing scholars and educators to collaborate and create insights that they would not have been able to do with a physical textbook or in an isolated fashion. So we're truly providing educational, economical, and environmental value to all the stakeholders within the ecosystem. And when we talk about the ecosystem, it's the students, the professors, and university as a whole, and then also the content creators and publishers. And beyond that, um, you know, we're, we're taking that Spotify, Netflix model bar a step further. And with Ecotext at the department level, we're looking to be embedded with intuition. So we're really removing the out-of-pocket costs that are associated with textbooks and really mitigating that, that stigma that students and their families have to deal with every semester. So really taking one step further, creating opportunity for affordability, but delivering 
a, a product that is really advantageous to the classroom. And we're not just another e-reader, we go way beyond it. And we're bringing the textbook to life. Um, we really, really pride ourselves on being a tool that allows everyone in the classroom to collaborate. So students are able to share their annotations, can highlight, bookmark, and take notes, but also share those annotations with their peers. And of course, on the professor side, they get analytics about what, what kind of activity is occurring within the classroom. So now we can close the gap within the classroom and really tailor that curriculum based on the insights that they're receiving. And of course, on the other end of the supply chain, give feedback back to the content owners and the publishers and really change the dynamic of the conversation of you know, not only what is the, the least expensive or most expensive textbook, but qualitatively, what is the academic content uh, that's gonna provide the most impact. Yeah, thank you for that, Joel. And, and, and really here to put it in perspective, we built out this application, uh, this beta application first round this past year, really to go out and prove the concept in the marketplace, really get a full understanding of, is this something that students want, educators want, and what they desire? And, and really, we, we have seen optimal success in that process as well. And currently, we are located in 26 different institutions spanned across 17 states, including some of our nation's most notable institutions, um, I know we, Eric and Rob, we have to get the University of Michigan on this list, but we have been really excited about, you know, the fact that students around the country um, and educators around the country are raising their hands for a better textbook solution, our solution, really spearheaded by, you know, Joel, our CEO, and other, you know, our technically profound uh, members of the team really building this product in-house. And as we look to build out the next iteration of Ecotext, um, we're excited about going to market with a product that is already heavily anticipated and desired in the marketplace. So, you know, here at Ecotext, our pillars are education, economy, and environment. Um, and we need your help to help ensure that every college student can afford the textbooks they need for a better education um, and creating increased opportunity through affordability, one textbook at a time. Thank you so much for that, Joel and, and Nelson. Uh, let's dive right into some questions that are coming in. Rob, you want to grab the first one? Happy to. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, for all the great questions. Uh, right off the bat, we've got a couple people ask, uh, Joel and Nelson, who are your competitors in the space? Can you talk about that for a second? For sure. I'll let it off to Nelson. He, he has that whole competitive analysis down. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. Um, there are a few different various competitors that play in, in this space, both direct and indirect. However, we really dif differentiate ourselves from the market by building those one-to-one -one relationships with the institutions. Um, as Joel indicated, really our, our goal is to be able to make that an item with intuition so students no longer have to pay $1,200 out of pocket for the textbooks. Rather, they can attribute scholarship aids and other grants to cover that cost as well. But then also going beyond being just a basic e-reader, really building out market standard collaborative tools that really optimize that learning process and not simply provide the textbook materials or the OER or the PDF materials for students in classes um, on our system, but bringing those to life, being able to you know, take notes in real time, highlight, share the annotations, and also have APA MLA style citations to go along with it. So really those two factors differentiate ourselves from the market, going beyond just being a basic e-reader, bringing it to life, but then also providing increased opportunity through affordability in regard of being a part of the, you know, those bottom line tuition costs. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And another question that just came in, what has been the reaction from universities, departments, uh, individual professors? Um, and I'll just leave it there. Sure. Yeah. So to answer that question, the reaction has been pretty positive. And, you know, students are excited because they're having a tool that is adaptive. They can learn on the go. They can collaborate. Professors are excited because now it's a centralized tool, then not only they can see the activity, the activity of what's going on, but they can ensure that we're helping address that educational inequality. Like Nelson mentioned before, about 30% of students don't buy textbooks because of the cost. And when you have more than a, a quarter of your classroom not having those material or at different editions, um, you, you start to have more challenges, especially when you scale up to the entire university. So that has been really, really been an impact for us. And it's been awesome to hear that people agree with that value proposition. And of course, with COVID-19 being a big you know, catalyst and also disruptor in how education looks and how we, how we function, being, you know, having collaboration tools that have been dynamic enough to help us you know, maintain that type of collegiate culture has, has really been a positive for us as well. 
Thanks, Joel. And I have to say, thank you so much for all the questions coming in. These are phenomenal questions. I realize we have really gotten a good group together here, and we know that we're only going to scratch the surface during these presentations. Our traditional demo days showcase one company for a full hour. We wanted to be economical with the time, so I do apologize in advance. I am certain we will not get through all these questions, uh, but do remember that after this, you'll be able to go to netcapital.com, see each of the individual pages of each company, and there is a live, there's a Q, not a live, there's a Q&A section on each of their of their offering uh, pages as well. Um, Rob, you want to cue us up on the next question from there? Yes, sure. Uh, we've got another great question. Uh, how will Ecotech solve the challenge of having enough authors, publishers, et cetera, uh, to utilize your service? Um, will, there, will there be enough textbooks available? Yeah, so it's a great question. And what we've seen is that most textbooks that have been published after 2001 have already existing in a digital fashion. And something that, you know, we take advantage of here at Ecotext is having a diverse library. So we not only just tap into those digital traditional textbooks, but OER, open educational resources that more and more professors have been adopting. We also allow professors uh, to upload their own PDFs and their own uh, electronic resources. And of course, we also tap into academic journals uh, in articles as well to really help with the sciences and whatnot. So having that diverse, uh, you know, different areas where we're pulling from different academic circles uh, allows us, you know, to be more expansive and to reach more different literatures um, and disciplines that we might not have been able, able to, to do before. Thank you for that. And we look like we have room for one more, and this has to be a quick answer. But this, so this looks like it's going to be B to C, business to consumer. The students are the target audience, paying customers, or is this more of a B to B play, business to business, reaching out to universities to get the students to use it? Yeah, so Ecotex is definitely a, a B to B game. Um, you know, going directly to the departments and the universities. We do have an intermediate B2C where we're building that traction and really leveraging the usership. Um, but our end goal, of course, is B2B partnering directly with the university as a whole. Awesome. Thank you, guys. We're right at 520. So we're going to move on to the next one. Thank you, Joel and Nelson. Next up, we have Watch Party presented by Chad Edward. Watch Party is a platform that enables content discovery with your friends. Take it away, Che. I could know myself. Che, you might be muted. Sorry, Che, you're muted. Apologies, apologies for that. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Che, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Watch Party. Watch Party is a social network that connects people through television. Like many good stories, Watch Party's story begins with Game of Thrones, and we hope that it ends better than Game of Thrones did as well. The fear of spoiler alerts prevented our team from talking about Watch, uh, from talking about Game of Thrones at work, and we were looking for a community to share this global phenomenon with. After the final episode, we were searching for what's that show to watch next. Whether it's cable, streaming, or live sports, we all know that feeling once you finish a nice binge. There are two things that you want to do. Talk to your friends about the show you just watched and find something new to watch. Meanwhile, COVID-19 has driven everyone inside, which has led to massive increases in screen time. All forms of streaming platforms are seeing huge increases in usage. And many of us have already exhausted all the Netflix recommendations as they only re recommend shows in their own promoted content or their genres on their platform. Without any insight into what your friends are watching, there's a social element to, to TV that is completely ignored by the current market. Watch Party plans to satisfy your social television needs by allowing you to track the TV shows you like and see what shows your friends like all in the palm of your hand. Watch Party is designed to let friends send individual show recommendations to each other, creating a curated list of shows that your friends have recommended for you. Watch Party will be built to trigger conversations between friends about shows that you watch in common and new shows that you didn't even know that, that they watched. This is extremely powerful as it provides information to people which didn't exist before or was shattered through your texts, Facebook, and Twitter. Watch Party hopes to strengthen our social bonds be between each other by allowing us to connect through our television shows. The market size for streaming television was $42.6 billion in 2019, and it's only going to get bigger with Disney Plus and HBO Max getting the mix as well. 
the average adult spends 37 hours a week watching TV with 613 million viewers on the streaming services worldwide and 120 million viewing households in the US alone. By giving people the, the, the information they need to facilitate watching more shows they like, we believe that anyone who watches TV is a potential user. Our current goal is to go after market share, prioritizing mass customer adoption. In order to generate revenue, we will design Watch Party to leverage targeted ads, as well as purchase links to watch shows on a provider of choice. We also plan to have promoted shows in order for TV networks to highlight new content on our app. Once we have a significant user base, we intend to provide a data subscription service to the entertainment industry with analytics on our social dynamics on their shows and content. The data that Watch Party could provide will offer a deeper insight into the new behavior of the existing data offerings today. We are currently fundraising on our capital to develop our MVP for version by building out our core features in order to begin user testing. Following a successful rollout of our MVP, as we onboard more users, we plan to track data and metrics on TV viewing habits to highlight the potential value of the platform. The Watch Party team consists of six people, including myself. Mark Sneed is our chief creative officer, who's the brilliant guy who thought of the idea for Watch Party. His background is in finance, as he previously worked at State Street in client operations and in fund accounting roles. He's now at J.P. Morgan as a fund accounting analyst. I actually started out at State Street as a business analyst on the same time as Mark, and now I'm a senior business intelligence analyst at Hot Invest Partners. I also recently just graduated magna cum laude from Babson's Graduate School of Business, getting my Master of Science in Business Analytics. The rest of our team consists of Amy, Rob, Edwin, and Ben, who all play critical roles on the Watch Party team. If you'd like to help us build the tool for all of us to find our next favorite show, invest as little as $2.14 at netcapital.com slash company slash Watch Party. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Che, and thanks again. More questions are rolling in. We'll start with Gaurav. Uh, how is this different from choices that Amazon gives based on usage? So right now, Amazon is giving you recommendations based on shows that you watch, but they're based on genres or core or metrics that are on their platform. Our app would be platform agnostic, so it wouldn't be limited to shows on Amazon. If you had shows on HBO, if you had shows on Comcast or Hulu, we would also be able to give you recommendations via that as well. Fantastic. And then another question here, could this also work as a plugin for different streaming services, similar to how Spotify shows you what music your friends might be listening to? Exactly. That's, that's a perfect example of how this could, uh, could play out. So our goal is to, as we get more user, uh, users on our platform, we would have plugins from your Comcast, your Netflix, your HBO, right into our app, and then they would then see all the shows that everyone watches. Rob, will you uh, propose Sean's question there? Yeah, of course. So we had a couple of different uh, attendees ask, can you talk to us a little bit about your competitors? Who are your closest competitors? Uh, you know, why is Watch Party better? So right now we view the entrenched um, social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter as competitors. They don't have any features that are like this right now. They mostly have features that are just, you can talk about TV, or watch party, which is you can watch your, the show together with friends, but that's not um, our, our um, value proposition. Our value proposition is to connect friends through the shows, um, not have people watch on them. So right now there are no apps that are doing what we're doing specifically, but there are other um, TV networks and services that are doing similar things, but not exactly. Thank you for that. And a bunch of things are coming in here. Uh, can you talk about over your revenue model? How do you plan to monetize this? Yep. So initially we plan to generate revenue through having ads on our, on our, our, our app and that would be targeted ads for shows and content. And then we also want to have promoted shows. So in our, in our recommendation section, every couple of shows, you would have a promoted show from ABC, CBS, um, HBO, things like that. And that's how we initially plan to generate revenue. But our long-term goal is to get a mass um, user base and then provide data su subscription services to the entertainment industry. So that would be tracking how many shows people watched, um, the usage metrics, how many times they chat about it, which friends they talk about it with, the region that they are, are, are located. So all those data metrics about the users, that's really the real monetization play down the line. 
Thank you so much, Che. I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you so much for the questions. Please continue to ask questions. And once again, uh, you can visit the website to ask more questions there. Uh, next up is Dome Audio, presented by Ben White and Super Bowl champion Tim Wright. Dome Audio has created an innovative new headphone. Go ahead, Ben and Tim. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben. How's everybody doing? I'm Tim. So we're going to show a brief video, and then we'll get into the question and answers. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate you guys and all that you do. I want to also thank Net Capital for extending this opportunity and having us a part of this conversation. We also want to thank the viewers for tuning in today and hearing about this opportunity. And at the end of the day, you guys are the inspiration, and that's what Dome is all about. So to tell you a little bit about my background, I started in the tech space about 10 years ago and uh, around 2009. And prior to that, I spent three decades in the music industry as a writer, musician, producer, engineer, as well as record executive. And little did I know that uh, my background as an engineer would come to be so valuable in the development of our headphone technology. It sounds better than like a voice. It's so clear, too. It's crazy. Better than beats. So let me tell you a little bit about my background. After graduating from Rutgers University and before heading into the NFL, I had a deep desire and passion for business. And in the middle of my NFL career, I was able to come back on campus at Rutgers and open up the first barbershop hair salon on any major campus in the country called The Right Cut. And now as I'm transitioning out of the NFL and after winning a Super Bowl championship with the world-class organization, the New England Patriots, and now I have an opportunity with the role as Chief Strategic Officer of Dome Audio Inc. So what makes Dome headphones so unique? Well, it's a patented technology and it's the first surround sound bone conduction full fidelity open ear headphones. So what's the advantage of open ear headphones? Well, unlike conventional headphones that detach you from the environment, open ear headphones allows you to be open and stay connected. So during this time of a pandemic, the one thing we're all seeking is a way to stay connected. So another unique feature of dome headphones is its dome covers, what we refer to as headphone real estate. So there's times when you want to disconnect, you have that option with dome covers. In the age of digital marketing, big brands are seeking collaborations. For example, Louis Vuitton and Supreme, or Off-White and Nike, they were able to utilize the already built consumer bases with each brand and to attract new audiences and consumers on their brands. So with Dome headphones and our headphone real estate, we're able to be the brand that builds brands. And for example, we have a concept cover with Louis Vuitton, our concept cover with Tesla. So with Dome covers, we have a platform to collaborate with brands and celebrities across all industries. And another feature of Dome Audio's technology is this proprietary app, which will allow you to customize your EQ and also have custom playlists, and that's just scratching the surface. And in addition to that, the future of Dome headphones includes three new product designs already in the queue. Thank you for the opportunity to present the ultimate headphone experience. Thank you so much for that video and you just stopped sharing. Perfect. Rob, I know you had one question for this group in particular, and then we'll keep, get back to the, uh, to the investor questions. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, Tim and Ben. 
Uh, one question that, that came up right off the bat is, can you talk to us about uh, where you are in the state, in the development of those headphones? Absolutely. Yeah, we're uh, just past the prototyping stage and we just brought on a product manufacturing specialist by the name of uh, David Albaldi. And we're right now in the pre-manufacturing stage. Rob, can you ask one more question, please? Sorry. Of course, of course. We've got a bunch coming in. Um, can you talk a little bit, are you going to expand the custom covers, not only to be for brands, but maybe for customers to design their own? <laughs> yeah, so, um, as you can see, you already seen the different uh, industries we'll be able to touch in, in as, as well as celebrities. But down the line, we will also introduce a strategy called Do Me. And Do Me is for all individuals who, have, who will be able to go online and customize their own colors with preset colors and patterns, and uh, they'll be able to have their own identity. Awesome, guys. That's and uh, one, one request, if you could maybe come a little closer to the mic, just okay. to make sure everyone can hear you. Yeah, um, just, just, don't, just don't knock us with that ring there. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one question, uh, Tim, hopefully you can speak to this. How well do dome headphones stay on during uh, fitness activities? Oh, they fit great. Um, ben did a great job with developing the design. Um, it doesn't move the, the, the dome covers that rest on, your, on the frame of the headphone. They don't impede or sit on your ears. So you don't get that, um, you know, that nag or that constant feeling where conventional headphones often showcase that. So um, it, it fits on great and uh, it's very, very snug. Fantastic. And then uh, two, I'm going to do a combo question here. Where do you plan to manufacture the headphones and where do you plan to sell them? Yes, yeah, so we plan to do nearshore manufacturing uh, and we'll initially start our sales in the U.S. And Ben, just the, so those, for those of us who aren't familiar with the, the terminology uh what do you mean by nearshore manufacturing right nearshore manufacturing meaning manufacturers who are not across seas uh and who are closer to the u.s uh, that's the nearshore manufacturers okay. and great what was that well no i was just going to also add to that in addition to our initial sales being in the u.s uh, primarily through e-commerce. Do you guys have a potential price point and do you have a sense of when they're going to go on sale? So, yeah, so our headphones retail for $250 and the various covers will be sold separately as far as the different brands and then eventually the Do Me collection. So at our, at our celebrity level, that'll be at the, the $50 range with our dome cover branded covers will be at the $30 price point. And then with our luxury brands such as Louis Vuitton, those will start at $100. Fantastic. And I think we have only enough time for one more here, but can you answer, um, do you plan to do custom flags for different regions? And also, uh, do you plan to leverage your relationships with the NFL? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yes, so we have uh, different industries. We've We've started a line for the Olympics, and so we do have an entire series of covers that features countries and flags on their own dome covers in the NFL. Okay. Yes. And then if you didn't have anything else that you wanted to add, then I'll move on to the next one, but I thought I cut you off there. I think we covered it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, well thank, you, thank you so much, Ben and, and Tim. Um, next up, we have Charles & Company, presented by Lawrence Charles. Charles & Company is a luxury tea supplier with multiple verticals. Take it away, Lawrence. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lawrence Charles, and I'm the founder and CEO of Charles & Company. We are a luxury organic and kosher tea, brown, tea brand. I started Charles and Company selling tea door to door on my bike, pedaling my way through the Santa Monica mountains, just me and my backpack full of tea. As sales increased and my backpack got too heavy, I handmade a cart to help me carry my product onto the bus. I was fortunate. People began searching me out on a weekly basis. 
celebrity chefs and business executives loved my drive and brought Charles and Company into their world, the world of Nobu Hotels and Four Seasons. And that's when everything changed. And I have control here. All right. Uh, throughout my men, uh, through, through my mentors and advisors, I learned that tea is just a vehicle. We're utilizing high quality tea to build a global consumer brand. And the, that brand strategy revolves around owning a piece of prized real estate, the kitchen counter. The kitchen counter is where life happens. When we entertain family and friends, we naturally gravitate to the kitchen. So we designed our packaging to be proudly displayed where all action happens in the kitchen. Once we sell to one customer and take residence on the kitchen counter, that customer inadvertently sells to countless others. And from, then, from this position, we're building Charles and Company into a whole brand, not just a commodity. We proved market, product market fit and we have positive growth metrics. Our average retail customer spends $40 per purchase. And in the second half of the year, customer spending reaches as high as $70 per purchase on average and $250 per purchase on higher end. During the holiday season, the average spend exceeds $700 per purchase. And those numbers are just retail. Restaurants and hotels spend upwards of $1,000 per order. We spoke to you about owning a spot on the kitchen counter, but how do we get there? So we do this in three steps. We first frame by telling our story and leveraging celebrity relationships and hosting garden party style events. Then we pollinate through gift baskets, our tea bars in hotels and places like the Four Seasons, Nobu, and restaurants like Malibu Farm, Olo, the Drake Pot, places like that. And then those customers take that information home, whether it's a picture or a tea bag, and then they purchase online. And that's how we capture our customers through our uh, online subscription service. Here are a few examples of what those steps look like in practice. For example, a boutique on Rodeo Drive uh, for a tea bar we were able to make $800 just for the tea bar. Langham Hotel uh, tea service, they paid us $1,400. Our partner, Christopher Guy, $750, $600 from Bloomingdale's. And BMW gave us $10,000 just to sponsor our own tea party. Currently our attraction is in places like I mentioned before, Four Seasons, Nobu, Malibu Farm, and we're starting to expand also in a number of other locations and countries. Future expansion, as we mentioned, uh, T is just the beginning. And we plan to license or joint venture teaware, servingware, housewares, biscuits, alcohol liqueurs from a picnic wear line at Target to tea where at Bloomingdale's. It's all about utilizing our partners and building on the backs of these partners that has the expertise in these areas. And thank you so much for listening. Again, my name is Lawrence Charles and I'm the founder and CEO of Charles and Company. We welcome you to join our team by investing through Net Capital. And we look forward to you. Um, Seeing, seeing our product on your kitchen counter soon. Thank you guys. Hey, thanks for that, Lawrence. Um, I wanna take a minute here and have a friendly reminder that anybody can go to netcapital.com and invest as little as $100 in any of these companies. Um, I, I figure I should probably say that once or twice during this programming. Uh, next up, we, oh, sorry, we have the questions. Question and answers, excuse me, give me a second here. Uh, first question here, and they move as soon as you look. And so how are you going to beat the taste of tea coming from India and sold in America? How are you going to make people come to drink your tea or buy your tea, uh, especially in comparison to people buying coffee? So if you could talk about 
uh, the the tea versus coffee dynamic here. Sure. Uh, so what's happening right now is millennials are choosing tea over coffee. Uh, one of the main things that we're doing that's separating us from everyone else is our story and how we tell it. Um, and we're telling our story, through, it's an aspirational story. And um, that's how we're uh, being able to build our brand cachet. And that brand cachet is the foundation in order to build a global brand. So that's how we compete. We compete with our brand, with uh, people trying our product and sharing with others. And, um, and that's how we've been able to expand thus far. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, another question is, where do you source your tea? So, so we source actually from a couple of different regions, from China, India, of course, uh, from South Africa. Um, there's the number of provinces within those areas, but we deal with brokers. So we're not incurring the cost of uh, the customs. So to be able to get it back over, but we purvey, get the ingredients and we bring it over here and, and, and bring it into our custom lines. Awesome. And then how much did you, how did you come up with the price point for corporate events? <laughs> so that was pretty interesting, actually. Um, so we just threw a number out there and just uh, took a look and see if, if, uh, if we could actually, if it actually worked in, in all honesty. Um, coffee bars are about $300. Uh, what we do, uh, you know, we took a look at the aspirational uh, value of it and um, we just sold ourselves at a premium um, of on an average of $750 on a day. And uh, if we do a tea service where it's um, depending on the number of people, uh, we calculate the number of people that will be at the event and we'll charge based on the heads of people that will be there. Yeah, and then I'll go ahead and ask this next question here. Your luxury brand seems to be a very important piece of who you are. How do you navigate that without, navigate that, excuse me, without alienating others? Oh, excuse me? I didn't quite understand that. Sorry, yes. Um, so you, your luxury brand seems to be an important piece of how you are uh, going to uh, leverage your tea sales. So how do you navigate that without alienating others? So how do you maintain being both aspirational and also approachable? Right. Um, so the way, the way we kind of approach that is uh, tea in itself is, is aspirational, but it's, it's also something that everyone um, shares and is commonplace in a sense that um, it's what everyone knows being that is second to water. And so our story actually uh, doesn't alienate, but it, it's inclusive in the sense that others want to have those moments to where they disconnect from the bills and the screaming kids and they actually plug into um, just their own solace or spending time with their friends and family. Awesome. And then since I've had the, the pleasure, since you're here in LA, uh, to try some of your tea, can you talk a little bit about the different flavors and then how you come to originate those flavors and the diversity of products that you provide? Right. So believe it or not, um, some of those numbers that I gave you were pretty interesting because uh, we only have um, approximately 13 blends on our website right now. And uh, we, we were able to uh, create that type of revenue um, per purchase per item and customers returning just based totally off of just that limited uh, picture of what our, um, what our blends are. Uh, so we have flavors like coconut chamomile, uh, creamy Earl Grey, uh, raspberry lemonade. Uh, we're producing some new flavors like Cuban mango, uh, where we're providing recipes for Cuban mango mojito uh, to go along with that. And, um, and so we're doing a lot of new, uh, uh, new actually opportunities to be able to uh, get into the market and capture new customers. Thank you so much for that, Lawrence. Um, we are coming around the home stretch here. So we're gonna do the last presentation. We'll have three minutes left uh, for a little outro. So last but not least, 
certainly not least, is Deuce Drone, presented by KJ Hadrick and Timmy Hussein. Deuce Drone provides last mile drone delivery for businesses. Go ahead, KJ. You might be muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. There we go, we got you. So hi everyone, my name is KJ Hardrick. Hi, my name is Timmy Hussein. And we're recent MIT grads who majored in aerospace engineering and we'll both be continuing to Stanford University for grad school in the fall where we'll, we will be pursuing both masters and PhD in the area of autonomous systems. We're here to represent Deuce Drone, a company that will transform the delivery system as we know it. Okay, so we start with the problem and the current issue for a lot of retailers is that it's become almost impossible to compete with Amazon and how quickly they deliver packages. According to a Bloomberg study, 77.6 million Americans live in a zip code where Amazon can offer same day prime delivery. And the reason Amazon can do this is because they leverage a large system, a large delivery network, which they use for a lot of the different products. Last mile delivery is extremely costly and relies on people. And for most businesses, this isn't something they can develop for themselves, such a huge network. And that's why they have to turn to other services to facilitate um, these deliveries. Yeah, so we'll be able to provide for thousands of businesses that wouldn't have had the resources to create a whole drone program, even if they wanted to. We'll truly be able to empower these smaller businesses and allow them to offer delivery times in minutes instead of days. These retailers that will be utilizing our services are already conveniently located fulfillment centers. They have inventory available and roof space for drone ports. We'll be able to leverage whatever infrastructure a business already has and make a custom drone system that works for them. Remember, drone delivery is as the crow fly, as the crow flies. So these are straight line trajectories that don't need to use roads or stop at stoplights. As a result, we can deliver these packages much more quickly. For example, our current drone has a top speed of 40 miles per hour. So that means we can deliver a package four miles away in just six minutes. And the more retailers we get on board, the more drone hubs we'll be able to put in place, which will ultimately allow us to further expand our network and our reach. And situations like we're in right now just show that we needed a contactless delivery service like this already in place so that we don't have to endanger customers or delivery personnel in times of need. There is a huge market opportunity for this because of all the different items that our drones will be able to carry from large items to small items, from food to, to groceries, and beauty to pharmaceuticals. And there are lots of retailers out there that will be able to benefit from a drone delivery service. So we're looking at a business that isn't relevant just now in today's climate, but will be able to grow in the future. And our service is one that a company will be able to sign up for. Our goal is to make it as easy as possible for retailers to sign up. And we'll consult with them and design custom systems to work for their needs. We'll do, that, we'll do the planning and the work required to turn their current workspaces or store areas into drone ports equipped for drone delivery. And we'll be in charge of both the front and the back end in terms of the software and the hardware. And we'll work with retailers to seamlessly integrate the ordering processes into the current systems and POS systems. We will also be the ones operating the systems from control centers that we'll put in place. And since we don't have to operate vehicles or pay drivers, we'll be able to provide our delivery uh, services with significant less fees and delivery fees on the consumer side. Um, we have a number of competitors in the space because Obviously, a lot of people see this as the future, including Amazon, which is no surprise. Um, but we are extremely confident that we will be able to put on uh, a unique, robust, and safe solution in place. Since we want to put out a service that any customer would want to sign up for, we have really put together an incredible cast of individuals um, to make this happen, where we cover all of the bases from logistics, aerospace and construction, to technology and engineering. General Blaine Holt is our expert in logistics, while Rhett Ross's CEO experience in the aerospace sector has been invaluable as we navigate new terrain with the FAA. Phil, Philip Burton is the president and CEO of one of the largest real estate development firms here in South Alabama. And as we built up his, and as he built up his portfolio, he has created invaluable connections to a variety of retailers. Then we get to John Fanning, the founding chairman and CEO of Napster, who has been a pioneer in the internet tech space for over 30 years and has created many connections along the way. Then for the drone tech itself, we get to myself and Timmy, who will both be pursuing PhDs in autonomous systems in the fall in Stanford University's aerospace engineering department. 
And recently, we have already begun to expand the team to fill app development, project management, and mechanical engineering roles. To sum everything up, Deuce Drone is the last, last mile delivery solution for the little guys who've been eclipsed by the giant corporations of Amazon. And as we continue to grow and get more retailers on board, we'll be able to create and expand a network of drone hubs, um, which will be conveniently located in spaces throughout the regions. It will also empower um, any retailer to offer delivery within minutes. And we'll be able to do this using our incredible cast of individuals, as well as the people we get on board in the future. And thank you for listening. We'll be open to any questions. Please be sure to invest on the Night Capital page. Uh, thank you so much, KJ and Timmy. So I'm going to do a little combo question here. Can the drones operate in bad weather? And how do they manage heavy deliveries? So currently, we have a maximum payload of around 12 pounds. Um, the weather situation, light rain seems to be OK, but the heavier stuff, that is, that is definitely an area that we'll be looking into as different drone manufacturers are able to make drones that are rainproof and, in general, can handle more winds. We're not a drone manufacturing company, but we are involved with all of the drone software where we integrate the, with the retailers. So as this drone technology progresses, we'll always be able and willing to use the latest and greatest drone technology. So as waterproof drones come along, we'll be shifting to those. Thanks, KJ. Uh, we had another question come in. Can you talk about the risks with respect to the regulatory requirements and have, have these uh, requirements already been defined? Yes, yes. so we have, uh, uh, I can take this. We have a number of um, regulatory hurdles we need to um, overcome, some of which is to do with the FAA and the restrictions around um, unmanned aerial systems and the use for both revenue and non-revenue tests. Um, also, you have to consider regions such as if you are in an area that's close to an airport, how do you deal with, um, how do you deal with flights and dealing with um, incoming flights, commercial flights, and, and then you have the drone delivery system working within that infrastructure. So there are a number of hurdles we need to overcome, um, but this is why we have our CEO, Red, Red Ross, at the helm, who has experience working with the FAA, and we're already in the process of filing, uh, filing waivers to deal with these um, and exemptions and certifications to deal with all these uh, hurdles. Great. And does drone delivery require a human operator or is it fully machine automated given a GPS location? So the systems that we're going to put in place are going to be autonomous systems where you can imagine that we'll be putting together these control stations where we will be able to monitor the various drones that are out there and they will all be running autonomously. And that, that's the goal. And we're trying to also develop the other parts of the system in terms of getting the package to the roof and having different drone ports to actually load the drones themselves. So we envision a future where we'll be able to create a completely automated solution. Awesome. I, I love, I love there's, there's a couple of futurists in here asking questions. So. Is there a world where the aerial drone deliveries are, you know, common and it become crowded? How much traffic do you expect? And is there a possibility that you'll need highways or something of the sort? That's also a future we've, uh, we've considered, especially as we begin to scale and we get a number of different retailers on board. You can imagine with um, a large network, you'd also have a large number of drones. And as competitors in the space also begin to launch pilot programs and, and rollouts, um, it's entirely possible that a new infrastructure would need to be developed to, uh, to deal with that. But we don't um, envision that being a huge hurdle. Um, systems already exist today which avoid air traffic, um, aircraft collisions. You have ATC. And it's possible that infrastructure of that scale would be necessary. Um, but it's been proven to be done in the past, and it could be done again in the future. Awesome, guys. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, someone asked, what makes your drones better than companies like Google and Amazon? Uh, if they've got more resources, how do you plan to compete? So I think we're unique in the way that we're approaching the problem itself. As I said earlier, we're not a drone manufacturing company. So we're not developing these drones from scratch. We're going to be able to use the latest and greatest drone technology. 
And also as we develop all these retail partners and we build these relationships, each one of these roofs will become a drone port that we'll be able to utilize. So we don't have to have a drone that can fly 100 miles. We can utilize these different roof spaces and we can do things like handoffs and charge batteries to ensure that we'll be able to cover a large area of people. Fantastic. And right on time, we have the last three minutes that I'll take now for an outro. So thank you so much, KJ and Timmy. That concludes our scheduled programming. A few closing remarks. More information for every company is available on netcapital.com. If you have any further questions, yeah, they could be asked on the individual company's landing pages. Uh, we will also share a link with everybody who registered uh, because this was recorded for posterity. And um, you know you can you can review and share, and we appreciate that very very much. Uh, please join me in thanking these five founding teams for joining us. I'd also like to thank Rob, our CEO Jason, and the entire Net Capital team for wholeheartedly embracing this initiative. Um, thank you for all the people and companies that use their platform to invite people to attend. That is incredibly impactful, and please continue to do so when we share the recorded version. Uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. It was our pleasure to have you and we hope this was informative and inspirational. Um, finally, the webinar is just the beginning. Uh, we will continue to create programming that supports founders of all backgrounds. And uh, if you have not already, please visit netcapital.com. You can create a free account by selecting the sign up button in the top right corner. You will automatically join our weekly newsletter, which is the easiest and best way to stay in the loop for future events, as well as other fantastic companies like these. After you've created an event, you, will, you can immediately start investing. Um, you can also check out a pretty cool video on the homepage with our CEO being interviewed by Jim Cramer's uh, CNBC Mad Money. Um, with that being said, I'm Eric Cox, and this is my good friend and colleague, Rob Burnett, and thank you again for joining us, and have a very good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Take care, guys. Have a great night. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, guys. You're Thank welcome. you. All right, founders, we appreciate you all being here. Uh, I'm going to end uh, the program for everybody, but great job. Really appreciate it. Eric, thanks so much for hosting. You killed it. Dude, I'm so sorry at the end there. My dog woke up. He's a 10-month-old a 10 week old bit puppy and he just and he's going ballistic because he's ready for dinner so i i know it was a little rough and tumble towards the end there i know we're, we're done uh but thanks for dealing with us i'm so glad you guys came and it was i think it was a really cool event